number two. We are beginning chapter two in our study, and today we're looking at verse one. We'll read through verse three, but we'll only be looking probably at verse one today. This <coughs> chapter continues from chapter one. There's really no break. Those that separated the text in chapter and verses, we went ahead and separated here, but there's no break really. So let's read from verse 1, chapter 2 of Romans. Therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same thing. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Father, in Jesus' name, now, Lord, we thank and praise you for letting us be here this morning and yes. having sensed your presence and know that you are here today. <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for those that have come out today to worship with us. And Lord, we now have read from your precious word and these truths from the book of Romans are so important. I pray today, Lord, that you will open our understanding to what you would have us see from your word today. Illumine our minds to the truths. And Father, I pray that we will allow you to speak to us and we will accept your word with the right attitude and, and we'll apply it to our own hearts as we must do when we look at the scriptures. Now, Father, I pray as always that you hide me behind the cross and help me to decrease as you increase in the message. Help me not in any way to block the view of the cross today, but may I magnify you and may we see Jesus in his name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Be seated. I want to speak to you today from the same, basically the same thing we've been talking about over the last several weeks. But today when we get to this part of the scriptures, we are changing and the writer now begins showing us a different group of sinners. We saw in chapter 1 the vileness, the wickedness, the unrighteousness, and how vile sin is in those that yield to the lust of the flesh and the desires that is in our flesh. Now he wants to show us the subtlety of sin. And he wants to show us another group of sinners that are moral sinners. You see, just because a person is not vile and outrageous in his actions and living in deep sin as far as the flesh and the lust of the flesh doesn't make him any less sinner if he's not living that way. It all has to do with what is in the heart. And I believe today that the worst sinners that there are, are the moral sinners. Because they don't believe they need God. They believe that they are good enough to get to heaven without God. They are not sinners. They don't need God. I haven't done what so-and-so's done. I haven't lived like so-and-so, so I am all right. I know God is not going to 
to judge me the same as he's going to judge those. That's the attitude. And when we have that attitude, we're in a position that is worse than those that God has turned over to the desires of the flesh because they know what they're doing is wrong and they're headed for judgment. And that's what Paul is getting to. You see, he's talking to folks now, and when he gets to the end of chapter 1, after giving all of these sins, everybody said, Amen, Paul. Amen. I agree with you, Paul. Amen. You really tell them, Paul. And now he turns around and says, Therefore. <laughs> Let's look at this thing from the other side now. And let's see if you are any better off than them. Because he says, thou art inexcusable, O oh man. What makes you think you are excusable? What makes you think that you are going to get by the judgment? There are two things he says here. One is that there are the moral folks that are living such a moral life that they believe they're living good enough to get to heaven. And then there's the other group that are hypocrites and they are putting on these outer front, but they are guilty of the same sin, although outside it looks like they're living moral. Now, that's the group we, we have a lot today. We have a lot of that today. People want to hide what they really are. And you can do that from man a lot. But you can't do that from an omniscient God. Because he knows and sees all. And that's what Paul is dealing with here. And we saw in chapter 1, verse 16, the theme of this book, the gospel of Christ. That's the theme. And what Paul is doing throughout this book is showing us how man can be right with God. And then he talked about the righteousness of God that God requires is a righteousness that he has to Give us because we are not able and we get that by faith, by faith. When we put our faith in what happened with the gospel and, and what happened with Christ, when we put our faith in that, it, we, we become righteous because God takes the righteousness of Christ and imputes it to us. And it has nothing at all to do with us being righteous within ourselves. And he goes on to show us why we need this righteousness. Over in chapter 1, verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. We need Christ's righteousness because the wrath of God <coughs> is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. And then he began showing us what happens with man <coughs> as he becomes more and more sinful by replacing the truth of God with a lie and accepting a God other than the true God and begins his way downward. And we see that God turns them over. <coughs> and last week we talked about him turning us over. To three different areas there where he turned us over. Turned them over to uncleanliness of the heart. Turned them over to vile affections. The body taking over and uh, becoming uh, against nature and homosexuality and all of that. And then he turned them over to a reprobate mind. So there was the heart, the body, and the mind. God has turned them over in all of these areas to, uh, to that that they wanted other than God. And now when he gets
gets down here, and he told them in verse 32 that they know the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So everybody that's living pretty good and moral is in agreement there. And now Paul says, therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man. Now I'm going to talk to you all, he's saying. That's not out there. I want to talk to you. And we want to see where you stand with God. Because he went on to say, for or whosoever thou art that judges. Who are you to judge someone else? For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same thing. And then he tells them this, this is very important in verse 2. But we are sure of the judgment of God is according to truth. You see, God's judgment is according to truth. Not our truth, but his truth. God's judgment is according to to the very truth of God. And when we look at God's word and we see what God requires to be righteous, it is total perfection. And in Matthew chapter 6, he said, except your righteousness exceed, exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll not enter the kingdom. And when people looked at the scribes and Pharisees and their outward walk, they thought, man, they live close to God. But when Jesus came on the scene, he said, you've got to have better righteousness than that. If you get to heaven, it's got to be more than that. And that shook them up. <laughs> they couldn't understand that. So now he's coming to the moral group, the moral sinners. And he says, you're inexcusable. Why? Because back in the chapter 18, he talked about ungodliness and unrighteousness. We talked about that. We preached the whole message on that. Because just because a person is moral outwardly does not mean he is godly. Some of the most ungodly people you'll ever meet live moral lives. But they don't glorify God with their life. They live for self. It's self that they live for. Everything they do is to draw attention to themselves. And they wouldn't dare think that they ever miss payment on a note. They'll always let you know that they've never been behind on their bills. <laughs> They'll always let you know that they haven't ever done what you or so and so have done. They want that seen. But inside, they're just as ungodly as you could ever be. Yes. Because they will not recognize God for who he is, nor give him glory. They live for self. Pride. Pride. And that's what he's talking about. You're an excusable old man. Whosoever thou art that judges. Now we have two groups of people he's talking to here. Back in chapter 1, he mostly talked about the ungodly Gentiles that live very vile and corrupt. And now when he comes to this group, he's talking about the religious Jews and the moral Gentiles that think that I'm good because I'm moral. Now when we as moral Gentiles begin to judge folks, we judge them based on the fact that we think we're superior. And there are certain things that we judge by when we look at folks. 
And one is we judge according to our skin color a lot of times. And we have a group say, well, I'm superior because we are white skinned. We, we are white supremacists, you know. And if you look at those guys, you know good and well that they've got a lot of intelligence. <laughs> I mean, their intelligence is just overflowing. And, and when you look, but, but they base everything, they base their judgment on whether or not I am black or white or dark or light skinned. And then we have another group on the other side that think because I am black, I am superior. Because when we study our roots and look at the black folk, you know, they, had, they were superior in the, the early days because they were the ones in charge and, and root. So we're superior. We, 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 we can't identify with you because our ancestors were very much more superior. So we base things on our prejudice, and that's the way we judge folks. Another way we judge is according to culture or civilization. And we say, well, we're more cultured than this group, so we are on a higher level than they are. Because we've been cultured. Well, when you look at skin color, you have to go back to the fact that the Bible said God has created a one blood, all nations. And then when we go back to run our genealogy back to Noah, then we run it back to Adam. So God never created any superior people. God only created man in his innocent state, one man, one woman, innocent until they fail, and then every descendant from them is a fallen sinner. Amen. There are no superior people. Everybody's the same when it comes to God. All of us are the same. We're mankind, fallen man that needs God. And then when we look at culture, we're going to say, well, we're more refined. We're more cultured. We're not like those folks. They don't know how to act in public. Look at the way they act. So that makes us better. Now, you know God's going to look at us at a higher uh, level than them because look how we act. They don't even know how to act. So we make judgments like that. We make judgments based on our education. And we see folks that say, well, I've got a Ph.D. And when they are around you, they don't communicate with you in a way of being equal with them. They talk down to you because they believe that they're superior to you because they're more educated. So they're making a judgment as to I'm better than them because my education level is higher. And we have then another group that would fit here that it's their moralism and they say, well, look at them and they start measuring everybody from themselves. And they say, I take care of my family. My children have been brought up right. My children have been brought up to work with a work ethic. My children have been brought up to respect other folk. My children have been this or that. And uh, we, we do this or that. So, so they're looking at their moral state, their moral state, and saying we're better because we are not living like you. And that's what Paul was dealing with here. Because all of these groups coming out and telling him, oh Paul, thank you for preaching chapter 1. We really appreciate that. We really know what God's going to do to that bunch. And then Paul says, look at your own heart and see where you stand with God. 
And now he says, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. Now we also got to bring the Jew in. Now he'll really start dealing with the Jew over in chapter, over in verse 17. And he'll deal with them in these three areas because the Jews thought simply because they were Jews that they were above everybody else. Simply because they were Jews. God had chosen them. God had given them the oracles of God. God had set them up with a, as a covenant. With a covenant. They were his covenant people. They are superior to everybody. And they thought there were only two groups of people in the world. And that was the Jews and dogs. Amen. Oh, everybody else was dogs. Gentile dogs. So the Jews said, we certainly are not in this group. We have been chosen of God. So because we have been set aside and chosen by God, that makes us a superior people. And God will accept us based on the fact that we are just a part of the nation Israel. And then, they'll deal with that, Paul will, in verse 17 down through, through the end of the chapter. But there's a second thing the Jews had, and they said, we have the law. Because we have the law, then we know the truths of God. So we're superior because God has given us the law, and he'll deal with that in those verses. And then the Jews said, if that's not enough, we have circumcision which is the sign of the covenant. We have a covenant relationship with God because we have been circumcised as Jews. So not only are we, are we superior nationally, we're superior because we've been given the law. And then if you want to go a step further, we've been circumcised as a covenant people of God. So we are superior to everyone. So we're Jews, they're dogs. And one thing they couldn't understand when Paul began giving the mystery of the kingdom was the fact that when Jesus came and he began the church and he started building this church, that there were going to be Jews and Gentiles together as one people in the church. They couldn't understand that. No way could they understand how God would ever embrace a Gentile dog and put him with a Jew. And... Paul is dealing with all of these. And when we look today, and this is one thing that's so uh, bad about religion in America. Now, I'm talking about those, I'm not talking about these outlandish false religions. I'm talking about those that claim to be Christian in the Christian religion. How many churches could you go to this morning? And as the people leave the church, if you ask them what is it that is going to cause them to get to heaven, what do you think you would hear as they come out the door? How many of them would say, because I do this or that? Some of them would say, well, because I'm a Baptist. You ask anybody about their relationship with God, the first thing they'll tell you is their denomination. <laughs> I'm a Baptist. I'm a Methodist. I'm a Presbyterian. I'm an independent church. I, I, and, but what we must be, folks, is a Christian. That has to take precedent over the rest of it. Because if we're not a Christian first, none of that's going to happen. But we'll always give what we associate with. And then we have another group that say, well, I was baptized. I was baptized. They, they baptized me right here in this church. So I am saved because I was baptized. And baptism will not get you any closer to God then walking outside looking up will get you. Because baptism 
reveals that we have been saved. And it shows this world that we have been saved. We have been baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, this just lets the world know that we're identifying with Christ as we go down and come back. They're dead and raised again. And then you'll have another group that'll say, well, I joined this church. I, I joined the church. And when I went and joined the church, that put me in the family of God. And the churches are filled up with people that have their name on the church roll that don't have their name on God's roll. Because the church membership will get you nowhere. And that's what Paul is telling them. He's saying you're inexcusable, old man. Because you're thinking that you are better than these that are living in deep sin simply because you look at some criteria that you have created and not the truth of God. But you are going to be judged according to the truth. That's what he said. And then we have a group that says, well, I take, I, I, I take the sacraments. I, I, I've been through the, the sacraments. So that makes me a child of God or that gives me assurance of heaven. None of that will get you to heaven. You see what Paul is saying? That anybody that has not saw themselves lost is still in sin. Because the first step, the first step to getting saved is to have a sense that you are lost. You're a sinner. Amen. And anybody that's never felt like they were lost without God has never been saved. I don't care what they tell you or what kind of criteria they lose. They you. If you have never saw yourself lost and felt yourself lost, You've never come to Christ for salvation Amen. because that's the first step Amen. in coming to Jesus. So then he says, who are you that judgest? For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. Even your judgment of someone else is condemning you because here's what he said. For thou that judgest doest the same thing. Doest the same thing. Now it's hard to get people to understand that if they are ungodly in their heart, that they're just as bad as somebody being unrighteous in their acts. Hard to see, forget people to see that. And one of the things we have to do is look how Jesus dealt with the Pharisees. In the Sermon on the Mount, you find in those three chapters, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and I preached through them several times, when Jesus comes on the scene, he reveals that God's law has to be looked at not from just the outward act, but from the desire of the heart. And righteousness and godliness, godliness means that I have Christ in my heart. I, I, I relate to him and I worship him. I glorify him in my heart. Not just outwardly on Sunday. Amen. But it's every day. It's every day. We come to church on Sunday and put on our little couple of hairs. And the rest of the week we couldn't care less about God. And I always say, what's your passion? What's your passion? Because whatever your passion is, is what your God is. Whatever your passion is, is what will lead you. Around, It's what guides you. It's what leads you. And we have people say, well, I'm a Christian. I'm, 
passionate about God, but it's not evident in their life because what their life reveals is that their passion is something else. My passion is my business because I will do whatever it takes to be successful in business regardless of whether it means disobeying God or not because my passion, my desire is to build a business. We have others that sport. And that's why I don't ever get excited on these sports stars. I want to talk about God. Because they'll mention God and everybody fall all over the set. They'll get them in every church in 17 states to speak because they mention God. And their passion is making it big in sports. Here's what they're doing. They're following their passion and they're using God yes. to promote their passion. That's exactly what they're doing, folks. I've lived for almost 65 years. I know a little bit that what goes on in a man's life. Because I, too, have been following passions at times and things. But I tell you one thing. When you get passionate about God, yeah. all this other stuff comes under that. And your whole being is right. Like Paul said, that I may know him. Yes. Yes. And whatever goes on out there, or whatever you you may be involved in out there, that takes a back seat to knowing God. Yes. And we look at things and we all the time talk about somebody and, and, and Lord, all they want you to do. Pray for me that I'll be able to be the greatest sports star. Well, I'm not going to pray no such nonsense as that. I'll pray to you to know God. Amen. Follow Him. And we have this group now that because they believe that they are superior, then when they come to church and hear the Word of God, they don't believe they need God. So here's what they do. When they read the Bible, they pick and choose what they read. Mm -hmm. I'll read this part because I like that. <laughs> you know, I can relate to that. Now this part over here, no, I, I didn't leave that alone. I, I don't really get into that. I don't care for it. I don't like it. I don't just understand. But I'll read this part. That really... That really Promotes me. And here's another thing they do when they come to church and they hear the message. They don't even apply it to themselves at all. They think about bull so and so getting it today. <laughs> yeah, they really getting it today. <laughs> or they'll say this, man, I wish so and so had been there today, then they got their load. <laughs> Because in 
the book of James. What did he say? He said, there in chapter 1 of James. Let's just read that so you won't forget. It. He gives us, he goes through the, the steps of sin. James chapter 1. He goes through the steps of sin as, as it takes over our life. Verse 13. And he says, let no man say when he is tempted, he is tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man, every man is tempted when he is drawn, drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And look at this. And when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And when sin is finished, it bringeth forth death. We began our downward, downward spiral when we began to let the lust that comes into our life, when we begin to desire. That is there. That's where we began our step down. And here's what Jesus is telling them in Matthew 5. You see, the Pharisee, there's one thing about the Pharisee. They were always looking good when they were in public. You never saw a Pharisee didn't look good. He was very moral. Now let me put this in here too. God is not condemning their moral living. That's not what he's condemning at all. Don't think that God wanted the Pharisee to just become vile and live. No, that's not what he's saying. He wasn't condemning their moral living. He was condemning their heart. Because they were putting on a front. It was a act. It was a like a play actor. They were hypocrites. They were putting on a, a costume when they got out in public because what they were on the outside is not what they were on the inside. And that's what Paul is saying here in chapter 2. He said, you condemn yourself when you judge others for it. When you judge others, you're doing the same thing. It may not be seen outwardly, but it's seen inwardly. And when he talked to them about adultery, in Matthew 5, Jesus said, You know what has been told by them of old? Thou shalt not commit adultery. And Jesus said, Let me tell you what God really meant by that commandment. Let me tell you what the commandment really means. When you look on a woman to lust on her, you've already committed in your heart you're already an adulteress when you look for the purpose of lusting. You don't have to commit the act. You don't have to go through the act. You're sinful because your desires is to sin. You may not have followed it through, but you desire to sin. One of the best illustrations, I think, is the prodigal son and the older brother. Yes, yes. Prodigal son just got caught up in the desires and the passions of the flesh and he just went out and lived very vile and wicked and wasted everything that he had. But the elder brother stayed at home and was obedient to the father everything he told him. He never did go out and do anything. He obeyed the Father. He thought himself superior to his younger brother. But when the brother came home and they had a party and they rejoiced because he had come back, the elder brother, what was really in his heart, came out, didn't it? Because there's a point when what's really inside of you will come out when you're put in the right situation. And they said, you coming in to enjoy the party? They said, no, I ain't coming in there. 
I'm not coming in there. No! His daddy went out and tried to coax him in. And you know what he started telling his daddy? All the good things he'd done. How good he'd been. You see, a Pharisee, a ungodly person that's ungodly in his heart, that, that may live moral outside, will always tell you how good he is. That's what they tell Jesus in Matthew 7 when they come up before him. And they say, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out devils? Have we not done many wonderful works? And he'll say, I never knew you. Why? Because anybody that would get in Jesus' face and start telling him how good they are, you know good and well they're ungodly. Because the one thing that we do know when we compare ourselves with Christ, we are fallen sinners that deserve nothing but hell. And it's on the mercy and grace of God that we enter heaven. So a true believer, when he comes before Jesus in that day, he'll be on his face and Lord, I thank you that you made a way for me to get saved. I thank you that you took my sin to the cross. I thank you that you didn't charge my sin to me. You took them and you gave me your righteousness. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for your grace. That's what a true believer would do. I stand up in the Lord's face and now Lord look here. <laughs> Pharisees always draw attention to themselves. And Jesus said, What's your heart like? What's your heart like? He went on and talked about several other things in uh, chapter 5 when he was dealing with the uh, Pharisees. He talked about Anger. You see, there are a lot of folks who say, well, I have never murdered anybody. I haven't murdered anybody, but Jesus said, if you are angry with your brother in your heart, you're guilty. You are as guilty. Why? Because you may not have committed murder, but you wanted him dead. You were angry with him. You'd like seeing him dead. You'd, you'd rather he be dead. You see, God says what's your heart like. Yeah. These folks are guilty because they acted like it. But what is your heart like? Do you have righteousness on the inside? And are you godly on the inside? As well as the outside. Now he says, you that judge us another do the same thing. Now when the elder brother of the prodigal son, when it come down to the end, we see him believing that he should be rewarded for his own goodness. And there are a lot of folks think that they should get to heaven because of their acts of goodness that they've done. How many believe they'll get to heaven because of their uh, charity? Of their social work? They're involved in doing good things to people. Surely that would get me some points with God. And you'd be surprised how many people that believe if they have given a lot to charity, they're treating people good, they're doing things to try to help people, that will register with God for them and get them in. And Paul is saying, you are inexcusable, old man. You're without excuse. Because God's not judging on the curve. God's judging according to truth. And God's judgment is the same for everybody. One thing that the Jews thought, they thought that God was a respecter of persons. That he would judge them differently than he would the Gentiles. And here he's showing them, and he will say that later on over in the chapter, that God is no respecter of persons. There's no variableness with 
him. There's no shadow of turning with him, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews. That means that you cannot stand before the sun and get a shadow that would somehow change the way God is. God is going to judge according to truth. And we'll never get by that. We'll never get by that. Now, I'm going to finish up chapter 2 next time. But what we see is that there are as many people in the church, if not more, that's dependent on their moral living to get them to heaven. And there are those that are living in sin outside, thinking that somehow they can get by God. And when I see that and you confront them with it, and you say, why would God let you in his heaven? If you stand before him today, why would he let you in? What would be your answer? What would your answer be? What could you say, looking down in your heart right now, what would you say to God if he asked you, why should he let you in heaven? If there's anything, anything, anything that comes to your mind other than because of the blood yeah. of Christ, yeah. his sacrifice, mm -hmm. his taking my sin, yes. then you are dependent on something that is going to take you to hell one day, yes. not heaven. Thou art inexcusable. Oh man, yeah. those that live in sin, vile sin, he told them that they were without, without excuse, excuse because God has showed them himself in creation and on their conscience he's written the law. And those that think they're good that don't need God, that live moral or live religious and are using that He's saying you too are inexcusable because God will judge according to truth. According to truth. According to truth. And with him, there's no shadow of turning. No shadow of turning. He, he doesn't change one iota for anybody. What God is, he is. What his word says, it says. Truth is truth all the way through. You cannot make it be anything else. And when you stand before God, you will be judged according to truth. And he judges us all here in this day according to truth. That's why don't become deceived in this area. Don't believe that sin is different for you if you're saved than it is for someone that's unsaved. Sin is sin regardless whether you have been forgiven or not. And what that means is that sin will not take you to hell because Christ took your sin and paid for it. So uh, there, there's no, no double jeopardy. You don't pay for it again. But what it does mean is that sin will be judged in your life here on this earth. If you believe you can sin and get by here, you too are a fool. Because sin, God will judge all sin according to truth. And that's another thing the Jews thought. They thought because we're Jews, it doesn't matter how we live. Because we are protected. They even had a saying that if a Jew started toward hell, Abraham is sitting at the gate of hell to make sure no Jew would have been there. That's what they believe. 
And the day we somehow believe, and you hear this all the time, I believe one time. So I'm all right. I talk to people all the time that are living in sin. And this is what they eat. Well, I was, I was saved once. <laughs> yeah, I, got, I went to the front. I, I believed. So I'm all right. I know I'm living in sin. I, but I know I'm, I'm saying I'm all right because I made a profession one time. And they're just as deceived as they could be. Because an empty profession will not get you to heaven. And if you are really saved and get in sin, God will deal with you of that sin. And he'll bring you right back weeping and crying and crawling your way to God. Because when a child of God gets outside the will of God, the first thing he realizes is that there is no joy or no thrill in sin. Have you been saved? It's gone. The next thing you realize is that once you break your fellowship with God, you have a miserable life. You're living miserable. And then the next thing you realize is it's not getting better. <laughs> it's going down from that. And a little while, God has you on the bottom and you're crawling, climbing your way to the altar somewhere to repent and get right to God because you want the fellowship again. Amen. We have people... Like David, when he sinned, when he sinned with Bathsheba because he got his eyes off of God and began entertaining the desires of the flesh. And after sinning, having her husband killed and thought he had gotten by with that, Nathan showed up. <laughs> There always be somebody show up if you really belong to God. And Nathan just told David a story. He said, David, what do you think about this? There was a man that had a family, only had one little little lamb, little you lamb, little one little big lamb. That's all he had in their household. And you had this other guy that just had all kinds of flocks and herds. And someone came to visit him one day and, and instead of him killing one of his out of all of the flocks he had, he went over to that man and stole his lamb and killed it and fed it to this traveler. What do you think about that guy, David? Man, David got upset, didn't he? Did you know we'll always get upset when we see our own sin in somebody else's life. It looks sad. And David said that man will repay fourfold. Because that was the law. That was the maximum penalty of the law. That you repay fourfold for a life. And all Nathan did was say, David, thou art the man. Now what happened? David was a man after God's own heart. What happened? Did David say, Nathan, I'll have you killed? That, that David was broken. Because he saw then his sin before God. And when you read Psalm 51, you see that repentance that David went through because he saw is sin. Christians that get involved in sin come back weeping. Yes. Weeping and broken over their sin. And they know that God deals with sin. Oh man, thou art inexcusable. Let's stand for prayer. Our Father in Jesus.
Jesus' name. Lord, I thank and praise you today that we have been given your word, that we can take it and we can look at it and we can use it as a mirror because you said it's a mirror. We look in it, we see ourselves. Father, I do pray that we will apply it to ourselves every time we come to it. And Lord, that we will allow you to clean us and keep us clean. Yes. That we may be able to fellowship with you and with one another. And that we may know God as Paul said he desired to know him. In the greatest way that any person that has been redeemed from sin can know him. We want to know him that way. Now, Father, I pray if there's anyone here today that needs to respond to you, you'll help them.